everyone, welcome back to Simming History, where we look at the history of architecture through the lens of The Sims. Before we get started today, if you like the video, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. Today, we continue a mini-series on World Fair architecture, and we're going to Chicago for the Columbian Exposition of 1893. Sorry this one took so long, but I had to find a way to build an entire city in one lot. Which means today, we're building not one, not two, but... Basically an entire city, little miniaturized versions of the fair buildings. It was really the only way to do this fair justice. So let's get into it. Just like last time, we're going to start off where we left off in the previous video, with Eiffel and the Paris Exposition. Eiffel's tower was built to a height nearly twice that of the structure that was previously the tallest man-made structure in the world, the Washington Monument. Unsurprisingly, America saw this as a challenge, and one they intended to meet. Even before Paris closed, the U.S. began plans for their World's Fair, one which would celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's 1492 expedition. But where would it be held? That question had to be answered by Congress. Many cities wanted it, but only four had any serious campaign for the honor. Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, New York City, St. Louis, Missouri, and of course, Chicago, Illinois. Chicago was so keen, in fact, that they had formed a committee of 250 of Chicago's most prominent men, and this committee passed a resolution that read, quote, The men who have helped build Chicago want the fair, and having a just and well-sustained claim, they intend to have it. End quote. On Monday, February 24, 1890, after five votes, Congress voted for Chicago. To finance and build the fair, Chicago formed the World's Columbian Exposition Company, and the company already knew who would be the lead designers. The Chicago architecture firm, Burnham and Root. They had already defined the Chicago skyline with their buildings, but more importantly, Root had developed a foundation that could support huge structures on Chicago's muck. His floating foundation, coupled with William LeBrand Jenny's skeleton frame, meant Chicago could build skyscrapers. Given that, it's easy to see how they were the committee's first choice. In fact, they had been in discussion with the city long before the vote in Congress was even held. Unfortunately, at that point, work stalled. By July 1890, the only things that had been established were the dedication date, October 12th, 1892, to make that 1492 anniversary, and the opening date of the fair, May 1st, 1893. But the committee could not agree on where the fair should be built. James Ellsworth, a board member for the company, traveled to New York City in an effort to recruit Frederick Law Olmsted, designer of New York City Central Park, to come to Chicago to help in the selection of the site. Ellsworth knew what Burnham knew, there was no time to spare. A site needed to be chosen, and construction needed to begin. At first, Olmsted declined, but he saw the fair as an opportunity to promote landscape architecture as a design field, and not just gardening. And so by the time Ellsworth had returned to Chicago, Olmsted messaged that he would come. In August of 1890, Olmsted and his assistant arrived in Chicago to review the proposed sites and offer their opinion. After touring the options, including Burnham and Root's clear favorite, Jackson Park, which was basically an empty barren bog on the east side of Chicago. But it was right on the lake, a feature none of the other sites had. So Olmsted ultimately supported Burnham and Root's selection. Still, nothing was decided. In fact, it wasn't until the end of October that year before the board officially named Burnham as Chief of Construction with a salary. Burnham immediately appointed Root as supervising architect and Olmsted as supervising landscape architect. And finally in November, the board approved Jackson Park as the site of the World's Fair. Almost instantly, the board ordered a site plan for the fair to be delivered within 24 hours. Root, under the direction of Burnham and Olmsted, drew up and delivered said site plan by the deadline. It was 40 square feet or nearly four square meters. Next up, Burnham set out to recruit the best American architects to design the buildings. There was just simply too much to design for their firm alone. 
but also this fear needed to represent all of America. And so he invited five men, three from New York City, one from Boston, and one from Kansas City. If your first reaction to that was, well, that won't be popular with the Chicago architects, then congrats. You thought this through more than Daniel Burnham. This decision was hugely unpopular throughout Chicago, and the board encouraged Burnham to add five of Chicago's best firms. Eventually, Burnham and Root were able to convince all ten to join. In January of 1891, all of the architects converged on Chicago to tour the site and begin the design process. Reportedly, the reactions to Jackson Park were not favorable and was more in line with despair. It was really a site full of dead trees, soil that was bad even by Chicago standards, and a changing shoreline which depended on season and water levels. Over a fine dinner that night, however, the men united behind creating the greatest fair yet to be seen. That was on a Friday. On Monday, they all met at Burnham and Root's office and officially formed the fair's board of architects. Root was absent that day as he was homesick. Burnham would soon have to leave to be with his friend and business partner as he worsened. Without these two men, the board of architects continued. There was no choice, no time to lose. They approved the site plan. They determined the size and location and placing of the main buildings. They set a uniform style, neoclassical, much to the dismay of Louis Sullivan, and set a uniform height of the cornice at 60 feet. There could be features above that, including arches, second floors, and domes, but the cornice would always sit at 60 feet. On Thursday of that week, Root died of pneumonia. But that following Monday, Burnham, who did consider quitting the fair after the loss of his partner, was back at his desk. Almost two months later, on February 28th, the architects and a few others met again to present their preliminary design. They had split up the main buildings between them. These buildings would be situated around what was called the Grand Basin and Lagoon, and they included the Administration Building, the Agriculture Building, the Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building, the Mines and Mining Building, the Electricity Building, the Machinery Hall, the Transportation Building, the fisheries building, the forestry building, the horticultural building, and the anthropology building. Among what became known as the great buildings was also the woman's building, not designed by any of these men, but by Sophia Hayden of Boston, who had won a competition directed by Burnham. Other buildings designed by other architects around the country was the U.S. government building, the state of Illinois building, in 33 other state buildings and 46 country pavilions. The architects realized during this time that they could not afford to build their great buildings out of stone. It would take too much time, so instead they agreed upon staff, a mixture of plaster and jute that could be spread over wood frames, or pressed in the molds to create ornamentation. It was basically stucco, and was going to be lighter, cheaper, and most importantly, quicker. In between these buildings was the Grand Basin, canals, and a lagoon. The basin in the main court included a large golden statue and several fountains and faced the Grand Court in front of the administration building. The canals connected to the lagoon, a ring of water with natural looking shoreline that surrounds the wooded island, a natural setting with walking paths that Olmsted decided for people to create to escape the crowds of the fair. You could also travel along the canals and lagoon via gondolas and electric boats. To oversee construction, Burnham moved to the site full time, setting up residence in a shack of sorts called the Shanty that just so happened to have a wine cellar. Now this did mean he was away from his family who stayed in their family home. On the door to the Shanty, he posted a sign that read simply, Rush. And so they tried, but the soil of Chicago proved to be not entirely cooperative. Most of the fairgrounds was cooperative enough that John Root's foundation design would work. However, a corner under the machinery building 
which would ultimately be the heaviest building at the fair, did not cooperate. The soil bearing ability in that corner required the use of pylons being driven into the ground until they hit stable soil, though not bedrock. This added additional time and expense that really they couldn't afford at this point. Still, they pushed on, and construction on the first building, the mining building, started in July of 1891. In each contract for construction, there were strict terms and deadlines. They only had, less at this point, less than two years until the start of the fair. One of the clauses included allowed Burnham to hire his own men at the cost of the contractor if work did not progress adequately. And so as construction began, Burnham focused on worrying about other things that could bring his fare down. He worried about crime or fire, so he created an extensive police force and fire department that served the fairgrounds alone. He was concerned about drinking water, causing a disease and pandemic. So he set about creating a water purification system for the grounds and piping water in from an area considered good in Wisconsin. Even as he tried to solve these problems that would hopefully never come to pass, there was still one lingering one. They were still missing something that could out I fell I fell. Loads of submissions from engineers across the country had been submitted of various towers, including one made with logs with a log cabin sitting atop it. None of these were deemed satisfactory. Burnham was invited to speak at an engineer's club and in his address, he admonished the engineers of America and the engineering profession for not coming up with a solution, saying a tower was not original, and they needed something totally new, not just big. An engineer from Pittsburgh was in the crowd, and his name was Ferris. In November of 1892, George Washington Gale Ferris submitted a design to the Ways and Means Committee for a giant wheel with the hanging passenger cars this wheel could hold 2,160 people and 36 cars and we peak at 300 feet above the ground. And it rotated. The committee enthusiastically approved the design. And so, everyone struggled on through the blizzards and windstorms of that winter. The damaged buildings that were not even complete. In the spring of 1893, the exhibits began arriving with only one building even near completion, the women's building. In April, a union strike threatened completion until Burnham agreed to a minimum wage and overtime pay. During this same time, Olmsted was struggling with lost and ruined shipments of plants, uncooperative weather, personal illness, and the loss of his assistant. But he kept working on it, him and the 10,000 men employed at Jackson Park. So was it complete in time? Mostly. On opening day, there still remained work on some buildings. The Ferris wheel was still incomplete, and Olmsted was not quite done with all the landscaping. Work continued with the arrival of the first visitors, but opening day itself was a, was a grand event, with President Cleveland in attendance. And at the conclusion of a series of speeches, with Cleveland's being last, the President himself turned a key, and engines all over the fair turned on, the engines in the machinery hall, the engines that powered the electricity, and the fountains in the Grand Basin. Initial visitation was low, but word spread of the White City on the lake, with lagoons and beautiful gardens, and before the fair would end, it would see daily attendance as high as 300,000 people. This goal was eventually achieved with the help of the Ferris Wheel, which conducted its first rotation test on June 9, 1893. On June 11th, with six cars loaded, the first test with passengers was conducted. The first testers include Mrs. Ferris herself. On June 21st, 1893, with all cars loaded and tests run, the Ferris wheel opened officially for visitors of the fair. In the first week of July, it produced over $30,000 in ticket sales, with half going to the exposition company and half going to Ferris. Ferris's share alone 
for one week would be roughly $400,000 today. On July 4th, paid attendance at the fair was over 200,000 people for the first time. One of the things that made the World's Columbian Exposition unique was that it wasn't really about one structure. Every other fair had had kind of one centralized structure of extreme importance that pushed the limits. And World Columbian Exposition kind of just pushed the limits entirely. It was really about the entire city. It was about the entire experience. Sure, there was the Ferris wheel, but there were also a lot of steam engines, a lot of electricity uh, displays. And it had a huge impact. The construction of the World Exposition was the first use of spray paint. And the power of the World Exposition, well, during this time, there was an ongoing battle between the direct current and alternating current electrical powers. Edison had visited the fair himself and he had recommended the use of DC. But Westinghouse underbid General Electric to provide AC. And this move, the selection of AC power for this fair, ultimately led to the adoption of AC power in the U.S. electrical grid. Doesn't stop there, though. The World's Columbian Exposition led to a push of what's become called known as the City Beautiful Movement which focused on comprehensive urban planning and the idea that cities could be beautiful, not just concrete and stone, but grand boulevards, parks, city centers. Basically, it wanted to turn American cities into something more resembling its European counterparts, like Paris or London. It also influenced architectural design. The White City popularized neoclassical and Beaux-Arts for years. Sullivan, who designed the transportation building, later stated it set American architecture back 40 years. He was the only architect on the board who designed a non-neoclassical building, preferring instead to go with something that reflected a more American design. And so his, really, was the only one that stood out amongst the Sea of White. So now that we've talked about all the roadblocks to getting to the fair, and what it took to get it designed and constructed, and, and its impact, let's talk about the controversies. Because this fair is not without them. I would even possibly say it might be the most controversial fair. Although not in this case because of the exhibits, but more about a series of events that occurred during the fair that really they couldn't have anticipated. First, the storm. On July 9th, a severe storm suddenly appeared and moved into the Jackson Park area. Now there was a hot air balloon ride at the fair and the operator saw it coming in, brought the balloon down immediately and got everybody out. The boats made for the disembarkation points and got the people to safety. The Ferris wheel, however, didn't unload. The passengers rode out the storm in the cars. In fact, the wheel exhibited no appreciable swaying, and it didn't even stop its rotation. All seemed well, minus some damage on the grounds. But the next day, in a weird bit of timing, a fire broke out in the cold storage tower. And while firefighters responded, an updraft caused it to rage out of control. Twelve firemen and three workers were killed fighting the blaze, some having jumped rather than face death by fire. The Assassination A Chicagoan by the name of Patrick Pendergast had received a head injury as a child. As a result, he suffered from delusions, an imaginary persecution. He had worked to get Carter Harrison elected to his non-consecutive fifth term of mayor, 
believing that if Harrison was elected, Pendergast would get an appointment to the government. When he did not, he went to Harrison's home the night of October 28, 1893, which was just before the closing ceremonies of the fair, and shot him. Harrison died within the hour. As a result, the closing ceremonies were canceled. And of course, the serial killer. This one is probably the most well known, in no small part because of Eric Larson's book, Devil in the White City, which basically provided all the facts needed for this video. The serial killer H.H. H. Holmes operated in Chicago during the fair. He'd actually set up shop before the fair started, but, well, he had built himself a custom house, if you can call it that, with a series of secret passageways and rooms that permitted him to kind of travel unaware to his guests. And he had guests, because he was operating it as the World's Fair Hotel. During this time, he killed at least 10 to 34 people, with a possible number of victims exceeding 200. The nature of the fair, people traveling in and out of the city, and the resulting kind of almost transient population meant people just kind of disappeared. And he took advantage of that. Making them disappear and then taking whatever money or claiming whatever life insurance he could off of them. Eventually, it did catch up to him. And on that cheerful note, thanks for joining me today as we took a look at the White City in the Columbian Exposition of 1893. Next time, we complete our World's Fair tour in Barcelona. Until then, you can find me on Instagram at Simming History, and on The Sims 4 Gallery will be the playable versions of many of the builds on this channel, including this one. Thank you to all the new subs. If you haven't yet hit subscribe and we hit a thousand, I will do a live build. So subscribe and share. I'll see you all next time. Until then, bye!